Hey, good afternoon. This is Ben Kuti with Quest Tech Solutions. It is 2 o'clock here in Houston, and we are at the Quest Tech facility. I'm sitting here with Oase Arshad, and I want to welcome you to our new series of podcasts. The goal here is to be able to bring more information to you guys online uh, in a different way. You know, I would hope that either you're driving down the road uh, listening to us, uh, whether it's specific topics, specific applications, technologies, we want to be able to put as much information as we can out there for you guys to learn and, and talk to your customers, or hopefully you are one of our customers you know, watching this, uh, and you can pick up something specific about an issue you, m you may be having in the field. So you should see a lot of topics for us. Today we wanted to start with uh, something simple, talk about mag gauges, a little bit about troubleshooting, uh, issues that we've come across, you know, how we approach certain things from the front end as far as design to alleviate any issues we might see. Um, but we want to break it down into a couple of different categories, talk a little bit about transmitters, uh, how OASIS structured that over the years to a somewhat simple formula of how we atta uh, attack that. Um, so without further ado, I have OASIS here with me. Uh, we want to go ahead and get into it. We appreciate you guys joining in. We hope that this becomes uh, a good tool for you here in the future uh, and be on the lookout for uh, as many episodes as we can get out there and if you have specific topics that you want us to cover by all means you know let us know uh, this is for you guys and uh, yeah we hope you enjoy so always uh, thanks for joining in uh, it's my pleasure uh, hopefully I don't mumble too much but uh, I'll try my best to be clear and uh, talk very simply about uh, mag gauges yeah absolutely and just so everybody knows we're uh this is a new thing for us. It was um, something that I opened the box for all this podcast equipment and got a little overwhelmed, but I think we're figuring it out. We're working through it. Uh, I like the fact that we're here in the shop, uh, a little bit removed here in our training room if you've ever been to the facility, but you may hear some things in the background. We've got these cool microphones, and they might be picking up some noise, but you at least you know we're working, and, and it shouldn't be anything that interrupts too, too bad. Uh, but again, yeah, keep in mind we're, we're working through this. All right. Well, if we want to get started, mags, magnetic level indicators, mag gauges, you know, they go by several different names. Um, the applications, um, if we're talking troubleshooting in general with regards to mags, uh, I think the key is always knowing the application. Um, the most important things to know about a mag are always going to be the minimum specific gravity, pressure, and temp that the mag was applied to first. Uh, and then, you know, if you can learn a little bit about the process or uh, the application the mag is in, uh, that's going to be key in trying to figure out what's going on. I think uh, the last four years since I've been here uh, at Quest Tech, uh, what I've seen mostly, if, if barely any, but generally the issues have been, if, if even though they've been far and few in between, um, it's generally been just misspecking the specific gravity. And not knowing the application uh, appropriately, uh, but also as well as pressure. Um, I think one peel something people need to realize: uh, you do kind of get what you ask for. If you specify a certain SG pressure and temp, that's what that float is going to be most likely rated for. Uh, if you want the float to be rated for something higher, simply specify that. Um, Got to realize that a float is not an ANSI rated product. So it doesn't, uh, you know, fall in line with class 150 flanges, class 300. Uh, could it be designed for that? Uh, yeah, but you got to specify that, you know. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, people are expecting one thing from a float, uh, and but specifying something else. So it's about, you know, specifying what you want. Yeah, absolutely. I th one of the approaches in the field is when I look at Quest Tech in comparison to any of our competition when it comes to mag gauges. Uh, one of the things that, that I always stick with is, you know, because we do everything under one roof here from mag gauges to sight glass to, uh, you know, tubular all the way down. I mean, it, it, it gives us a bigger fail safe to say, you know, hey, a mag gauge might not be right for this application. To be in. And you're talking about application. I think it is up front. It's the most important thing with a mag gauge to understand um, a mag gauge is going to perform to what the information that that's provided to us. So if it's coming from, you know, an operator in the field, 
you know, we want to work back with engineering and, and talk a little bit about, you know, the, the application itself. We need both perspectives. We need to know what's happening in the field from an operational standpoint, mm-hmm. if there's flashing or if uh, boiling or, and those things can be, you know, you can figure that out on a data sheet and talking to engineering, but, but there are things that are happening in the field that we need to plan for and design for. Yeah. If things are coming up and down, you know, frequently, uh, you get those carbon steel fines running through your pipe and it'll attach to your float at some point and weigh your float down, you know? So when I think of troubleshooting on mag gauges, I think it all ties to the application and understanding how it was designed on the front end, um, again I, I relate that back to the fact that we have everything under one roof if if i look at an application and there's a want for a mag gauge and three companies are quoting this mag gauge and quest tech and oase and i look at it and say well it's got flashing or boiling you know and we spec it out and design it for that if the next company doesn't and our price you know is 30 percent higher well we feel confident in what we quoted because it should work and it should work for the long haul um yeah, it's a mag gauge is definitely a, a consultative sale. Uh, it's not a product you want to sell blindly without knowing too much about your application. So knowing the application is definitely key. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think up front it's one of the most important things. I don't see a lot of troubleshooting on mag gauges yeah, I mean, themselves. You know, it, it's like you said, it's all about application. Yeah, yeah. I, I get calls and half the time or more than half the time, customers already diagnose it themselves. Yes, I had one... Uh, just the other day, um, they were pretty sure the instrument wasn't designed for interface, and they had an interface application, and this float is always floating at 100% because it's not syncing past the top level and floating on the interface of the two levels. And go back to the serial number is how we trace everything here, uh, and clearly what we specified to us was not an interface application. So All right. uh, it's, it's basic troubleshooting like that. I mean, just knowing the application can help you solve the problem on a mag gauge. Yeah, I think the the thought process behind doing something like this, sitting here having this conversation, is uh, in the fact that you know, hopefully, our what our reps take from this, and and you guys are listening to this right now, is understanding the application is the most important part. Just gathering the information that we ask for is super super important. But the more detail we can get from the customer about one, are we replacing another mag gauge? Uh, because of, that's a lot of what we do is, yeah. you know, hey, we're having issues with this mag gauge and needs to be replaced. Well, the first time that was sold, it was probably in a more competitive situation where people were quoting the bare minimum to make sure they got the job. Mm-hmm. But it might have needed something, you know, like a oversized chamber with guide rods, you know, if it was dirty service or full bore connections or, right. you know, all these different things. So having the conversation with the customer up front or, or letting the customer know and setting the expectation that, hey, we want to do what, what's not just going to get us the PO, but in six months it's going to continue to work. And on the other side of it, you don't want to sell something that six years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is yeah. In, in a few months, we're going to be getting service calls about it. So uh, application to me is the most important thing on mag gauges. And I, I attribute all troubleshooting to the mag gauge itself back to the original, uh, design, you know, you know based on the information we have. Uh, I took hundred percent agree. Yeah. When it comes to transmitters, I think that's where most of my troubleshooting calls have been over the years. Uh, so much of that is dictated by what's happening in the field as well. You know, when you talk about wiring and electronics, um, let's talk a little bit about the system that we use that if one of our uh, reps was on the road or, or with a customer, you know, that they can use to at least gather the information uh, to let us know we're looking at this the right way. Okay. Yeah, um, just moving backwards just a little bit for a few seconds. Uh, serial number, serial number, serial number. It's key to us being able to pull paperwork fast for you. Uh, you know, uh, we can, you know, I don't need, I only need the serial number of the mag gauge. I don't need all the other ancillary equipment that's on the mag gauge. If we sold it, it's all traceable back to that mag gauge serial number. So for troubleshooting purposes, that's the quickest route, in all honesty. Um, now, going back forward. Uh, transmitters uh, honestly been a passion of mine uh, been in the industry for about 15 years 16 years now uh, so I have worked with transmitters the whole time um, and I have a passion for McNeil Strickland in, in, in particular uh, I think they're great instruments um, and they when they're utilized properly they're I mean they're flawless honestly 
but uh, they can leave a bad taste in your mouth if they're not applied correctly or if uh, you know uh, something has gone wrong in field from the beginning that has nothing to do with even the instrument so with regards to troubleshooting uh, a transmitter and you, you're gonna you're gonna hear me say you're gonna hear me say transmitter a lot uh, and speak generally because these ideas that I've kind of come up with uh, I've just kind of built up over time and and uh, they could be applied to any 4 to 20 instrument, in my personal opinion. Uh, could be wrong, but that part of it's kind of my opinion. So, uh, again, so the first thing I do when someone calls about uh, a uh, problem with the transmitter, uh, I want to know its symptoms. What is it doing uh, current-wise? Uh, what is its output doing? Uh, if that can be described, uh, it can be highly helpful because uh, transmitters are designed to do certain things. Uh, when they're not operating correctly uh, and then so whatever it's doing can then be symptomized and we can possibly look it up on a chart and, and, and know what the issue is but uh, the most common issue that occurs with uh, magneto restrictive transmitters in general uh, that I that I have seen um, and witnessed and serviced and, and, and you know still continuously take calls on um, every now and then uh, is basically the instrument will behave erratically or what the customer uh, you know observes as being erratic behavior where it's uh, either reading the correct reading for a while and then jumping to and a condition where it's either goes into some sort of alarm mode or jumping to some random value or it's continuously erratic meaning it's not holding a constant state uh, of reading and that can be caused by many different scenarios and ho hopefully I'll touch up on on all those scenarios here but uh, the first rule of thumb in my opinion is I want to figure out is the issue the instrument or is the issue coming from the plant side meaning the wiring or the power supply or a combination of the two and uh, so the first mm -hmm. thing I if, if I could ever recommend anyone in field to do is you know invest in a multimeter uh, or a uh, loop power supply uh, meter uh, because the first thing I'm going to ask anyone to do at all times is isolate, meaning I want you to physically take the wiring off the instrument so, so you're removing it from the field wiring and the field plant supply and you are now going to power it locally with a loop calibrator. Uh, so so this multimeter or uh, loop calibrator is just a, it's an external power source? So external power source locally, battery powered pure d d uh, DC voltage, uh, meaning n no noise can be introduced uh, into that scenario. So what I'm trying to do there is to figure out is the instrument, is the issue lying with the instrument or is it lying in combination with the instrument and the wiring and the plant supply? So if you isolate it, power it, and it begins to behave just fine, hey, you know what? Your issue may not be the instrument at this point. Uh, you may need to look deeper further down the line along the wiring along the power supply and you know everyone wants to think and in all honesty you, you, you know no one wants to say oh we wired a band uh, a plant incorrectly or we did something wrong while wiring but uh, I think I've had maybe one case in my 16 year career where it was the instrument and not something right. on the plant side so you mentioned so noise I mean that's something that so is a common occurrence, I think, with plant wiring and, and these instruments. It, it is a very common uh, occurrence. So w what can go on is uh, the most recent service call I had was uh, maybe late last year or, or really early this year, early January, where I just I kind of knew it just wasn't the instrument. Uh, customer was complaining about this thing, always uh, showing below 0%, uh, meaning that tells me this was a bottom mount instrument like the head was at the bottom the level is somewhere at 50% in in the mag gauge and but the instrument is showing 3.5 milliamps which is a failure mode uh, of, of the instrument or it's 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 showing something some level random level jumping between some random level between where the actual level is at and where the electronics head is at so at that point I'm thinking you know I, ha I have I have the IE project engineer saying they just want a new transmitter and I'm like, do you mind, you know, if I come out there and check this thing out for you, and you know, let's let's look at it together, because this was a ten foot 
transmitter. It, yeah. It's not going to be easy to uh, get a warranty unit out there. So let me go look at it. So we go look at it, and um, as soon as I, you know, isolate it, first thing I do when I get there, this thing works just fine. So I'm like, okay, we now, now have you can to work backwards. Now we gotta work yeah. backwards. So let's go to your supply. Let's see what's going on. Basically, in the end, what we learned was, unfortunately, the wire, this instrument was so far from the rest of the plant. Um, I guess they had such a um, tight schedule, they couldn't get the li the correct wiring, the correct loop wiring uh, in time to complete their project. Uh, and what they ended up using, in all honesty, which I do not recommend, is residential power wiring, meaning the same wiring that you see in your home you see uh, you see a ground you see a, um, a a positive and a neutral basically your AC wiring that's just a bundle of three cables it was what they were able to get their hands on that was a long enough run to get it all the way to this instrument mm -hmm. uh, which had to be 3,000 feet away uh, and it, it was this was you know really far from the rest of the plant so you know this instrument was picking up noise um, all 4020 instruments, in all honesty, will always need twisted, shielded pair of wiring. So your plus and minus wires must be twisted, and it must have some sort of shield running along with those wires. So what's the difference in the power in the wiring they used? It's just three separate wires bundled together in, in one jacket. Uh, one of them, you can say behaves like a shield, but they're also not twisted. They're also, uh, yeah. twisting wires has a special uh, uh, phenomenon that occurs that helps cancel out noise throughout long runs. So we did something awkward uh, that uh, normally you wouldn't do, but again, what's happened isn't normal either. Uh, you shouldn't necessarily be using that wiring. Uh, so uh, what may be considered an electrical no-no actually works here. Um, you ground the ground wire at the power supply and at the instrument. Uh, and that solved their problem. You, it was kind of uncanny to watch this happen. They would connect the ground wire at the power supply, and then we sat there, and they took the ground wire of the instrument, and they touched the housing, and you watched the instrument work. They removed it from the housing, and you mm -hmm. watched the instrument go haywire. This was within a second. This would happen. So, you know, uh, in this case, the, the issue, w in my opinion, was the wiring. Uh, the way we isolated it to the wiring was I, I went back with my loop calibrator all the way back to where the power supply was and I put my loop calibrator on their wiring and this instrument was still noisy and I was like you know what it's not their power supply because this loop calibrator is pure DC it's battery powered it's got no noise on it so this thing is picking up noise from the plant throughout something else is weird is going on you know they're claiming to me that it's a continuous run of wire um, okay, I'll take your word for it. It's a continuous run. You have no breaks in the wire anywhere. But what we learned in the end, and it was continuous, th that we did learn that. Just because if you wire. But if you ground the shield on, on both ends in this case, because it was residential wiring, it helped this instrument work. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I mean, the main thing is it, through use of what we'll call isolation is step mm -hmm. one. Uh, that alone can tell you so much about how the transmitter is performing, and then it can either one eliminate the transmitter is the issue, from what I'm understanding, uh, quickly, or validate that your transmitter has an issue quickly. So it should be step one in all cases, um, and we'll we'll leave the name of that plan out. No worries. Yeah, purposely uh, left it out. Yeah. Uh, because I've seen it in more than one scenario. Well, we've seen. I mean, you know, what you see in the field, you see things everywhere, and, th and that's the point is having the knowledge base here to work with uh, anything that's out there, but through the simple use of the formula, through isolation first, we should be able to uh, identify what's happening. Uh, so after isolation, what, what else are we looking into? Uh, now this is going to sound like I'm saying the same thing, but it's not. Uh, grounding the instrument, uh, meaning earth grounding the instrument locally. Most every 4 to 20 uh, you know, transmitter has some sort of ground lug on the outside of its housing. Uh, and if we believe that noise is, is, is a scenario here after isolation uh, and you've proven that that the instrument works fine when you isolate it, 
earth grounding the instrument uh, is very key and very important uh, to, to do that. Uh, the third thing, uh, a, which, you know, um, we like to think we send every instrument out here, uh, you know, ready, set, go, meaning all, the all we want the customer to do is bring power to it. They don't have to recalibrate these things. They don't have to rearrange them. We test them here. We make them function to the specified range that the customer specified to from the very beginning. So uh, configuration uh, of the instrument I is key. Uh, and knowing how to configure the instrument can be key because a lot of times, uh, you know, these things will get in field and folks don't know if these things were configured or not. Uh, by the factory. Uh, just know that everything you get from Questec is. Uh, we're, we don't want uh, you know people to have to do configuration in the field. We're trying to alleviate all that. That's you know we're kind of a turnkey package that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we we utilize that as many times as we can to be able to say, look, w everything came to you calibrated, ready to go. But really, what it does for us is it eliminates the questions in troubleshooting. If they do call about it, we know what was done, you yep. know, on the front end. As long as we can verify they haven't made any major changes, um, then, you know, we know where to start. Yeah. Uh, so, so one of my, you know, second or third questions is, has anyone tried to reconfigure this thing in the field? Because if they have, there's a good chance, you know, they've miscalibrated or misrearranged it, which can cause a phenomenon of erratic behavior from a 4020 instrument. Um, the other reason... Um, you know, instruments uh, in general is when they're not applied right, and and I hope I say this correctly, mechanically. Uh, you know, magnetostricted transmitter, electronics, sensor probe, you know, these things aren't designed to see high heat directly. So if it's not designed appropriately, meaning there's a blanket involved and the sensor probe is outside the blanket when there's heat involved, uh, or the electronics are remoted if they can be, uh, if, the, if the design from the beginning I I is not appropriate, uh, the transmitter could be feeling the effects of the application. In this case, you know, for example, heat. Uh, so heat's eventually going to deteriorate this thing. It's going to weaken the signal that the, that the tra transmitter sees, and that could be the problem you're having. Uh, it could be an application, knowing the application of the map, and was the transmitter applied correctly to it. Uh, configuration. Uh, you know, these things are configured here from... Uh, Zero to 100% here, uh, based on drawings that, that we generally uh, send during the approval drawing process. Um, and we give, we actually give, and a lot of people may not realize it, we give a little bit of extra dead band on our instruments, meaning I'm not operating my zero and 100% at its minimum extremity. I have a little cushion in there, uh, meaning, uh, you know, so to ensure that this, this, this isn't going to be the issue, you know, uh, for the end user. Because a lot of times people, you know, they love that, they love the specifications on paper. Oh, this thing's only got a dead band of, of two inches. Well, you know, if my design isn't really affected by a two inch dead band, why can't I push it to a four inch dead band? And yeah, just, if we've got and just that get you away from with, the end absolutely. of the instrument. Well, you push it outside of where the float can physically yeah, travel. Exactly. You know, and, and we keep ourselves in range. So, yeah. you know, these instruments are designed to communicate to you in a certain way. Four to 20 is zero to 100%. So what happens when something goes wrong with this instrument? It's got to do something. It's got to let you know that something is going wrong with it. And most of these instruments are designed to go into a fail mode. Uh, they go high, low, or some are even able to hold out, meaning they'll hold their last good reading while flagging to you on a display or through a heart communicator that, hey, I'm actually in error. I'm just holding my last good output. But uh, most of them go either high or low, uh, meaning above 20 milliamps or below 4. Right. Uh, and in our case, by default, we pretty much send every instrument out here, uh, maybe restrictive wise, uh, at uh, fail low. Uh, so they if any four. so if anything goes, um, you know, something wrong, uh, the instrument's going to communicate to you by going 3.5 milliamps. And that's just another thing that we do, so we know when somebody calls, you know, where our failure should be, helps us eliminate things as we're troubleshooting. And that's not to say that failing high is not an option. Uh, that's definitely an option. That can be changed in field. Can be changed through the display. Can be changed through a heart communicator. Yeah, uh, if that if that's going to cause a reaction, you know, somewhere else in the plant, you know, they can specify where they want their failure. But of course, we're trying to keep them from having that failure by doing things like setting that the dead band outside of the the range that the float travels. 
Um, okay, so if you were going to break that down into um, what to take away from this, you know, through the talk of the transmitters, it's first to uh, isolate. Mm -hmm. And Isol then isolation, earth grounding, and then consider the configuration of the instrument. Um, and that's, that's one, two, and three on the transmitter side. But even before the transmitter side, look at the application of the mag. If this transmitter right. is on the outside of a mag, look at that first. Um, make sure that it's not being affected by just the way it was designed. Uh, Absolutely. I mean yeah, and it goes back to the beginning of, of how we troubleshoot mag gauges. The way I troubleshoot a mag gauge is to talk about the application and how it's functioning in the field. Um, is there a simple, you can go grab an external magnet, go out and find the float? Yeah, if you need to. You know, and that's, that's not saying you need to in every situation. If you want to verify where your float is, yeah, absolutely. You can go find it with an external magnet. Yeah. Well, take a paper clip so you can get a magnet. If mm -hmm. you're just trying to find the float. Yeah, the paper clip will... will you can do a paper clip. You if you're not trying to move the, yeah, the yeah. float. If you're not trying to move the float or the flags, take anything that's, you know, ferrous. Take a paper clip, take a screwdriver, uh, feel around the, the chamber for a magnetic field. Um, that, that could help solve a lot of problems. Okay. Well, lastly, what, what do you recommend um, as far as equipment that a plant would keep on hand or what's realistic for a salesman to keep on hand who deals with these you know often um i mean if if our if our reps or, or salesmen are, are offering service you know to their end user or our, our customer in the end um, i think the best investment anyone can make uh, personally is are these little um Fluke meters, uh, th I think we use the 789, the multimeter fluke 789. Basically, it's it has the ability to, it's a multimeter, so it can measure resistance, it can measure all sorts of things for you, but what it does that is most valuable, in my opinion, is it, it can power the instrument while measuring the current for you, um, so you're able to isolate from the plant supply. I mean, that can tell you a lot about the, uh, you know, a lot about what's going on uh, real quick. Uh, so I think investing in a, a loop calibrator type uh, multimeter is uh, probably the, my initial recommendation. For the plant or for the salesman? Yeah. Um, and there are plants out there just they don't invest in that, uh, which is really shocking to me. It's like, you guys have quarter tone instrument sales? And that would be the first thing I would heart communicator i mean is that something that's still pretty it, prevalent if I, I i do it is it's very prevalent but uh you know those things are pricey yeah. uh, and, I, and i can understand why someone wouldn't want to uh, invest in those but they have their value they're they're highly valuable if you've got the funds for it you should it it allows for you know quick configuration of all you know heart instruments uh, well as far as our transmitters are concerned you know i think the digital display allows for so much now that through that and through the formula of, you know, isolation, earth, ground, and then considering the uh, configuration, you should be able to work with everything that you need to, you yeah. know, from a plant's perspective. Or we could travel, you know, I mean, I know you and I have taken trips together to go look at different things, and, you know, we have everything we need to, uh, to go out and service this equipment, whether it's just through uh, the hard communication program, you know, that we keep with us, or, uh, like you said, these little flute meters or... Yeah, um, and you you know, heart communicator, it, it allows for basic configuration of the instrument. And that's generally all that's needed. Uh, the other thing I would like to, uh, to remind everyone, uh, again, our goal is a set it and forget it type thing. But you really don't have to touch these these settings in these instruments uh, because they're not going to change on their own. Uh, they're not going to lose themselves over time. Uh, so, you know, when an instrument is calibrated for 36 inches, it's calibrated for 36 inches. It's not magic. Right. You're going to start putting a 4 to 20 out. That represents something else. So unless someone else has gone in at some point and changed that configuration, and maybe rightfully so, maybe that's what they needed to do because their application changed a little bit yeah. uh, by the time the unit was sold. But uh, generally, you don't have to get into the configuration side of things. Should with, be with turnkey. With Absolutely. With everything we're doing because we have be approval turnkey. drawings. We're matching it to the approval drawings. Uh, and the only time I see that being necessary is if something has changed in the time we sold it to the time it got in field and installed so uh well good yeah. well great well i think um you know through this we should have at least the formula to be able to talk with our customers about how we attack 
working with the transmitters and this isn't just a quest tech and, and mts transmitter issue this is yeah. if we're going out to look at a replacement this is where we need to start anyway to make sure that we don't put out the same thing that's going to have the same issue perfect yeah okay well great well ace i appreciate it uh good to have number one out of the way i think we'll be doing plenty more of them I uh, want to thank our sponsors for today. Our sponsors for today are actually Rhett and Shelly because they let us take these ideas I have and let me go spend some money and set up this podcast room. So, Thanks, Boz. Be on the lookout for more of these. Like I said, we're going to keep these coming. We want to keep them from anywhere from a few minutes up to 30, 45 minutes, probably no longer than that. Uh, the goal is if you're on the road or you're heading home to and from the office or in between, you know, sales calls, uh, we want to give you guys the opportunity to learn a little bit and be able to go with a little more knowledge to that next call. So thanks, Oase. I appreciate it. We uh, look forward to doing some more of these with you here in the future, talking about mag gauges. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, welcoming all the feedback from our reps you know we can get into more detail based on your questions uh for future podcasts you know absolutely no we want this to start a conversation uh send it to your customers send it to everybody we appreciate it